Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today we're gonna answer a few of your questions. It's been a while, but I was sick, so let's get to work. Before we start, let me just tell you a little bit about this orchid. This is an orchid, a cat layout, which I have for quite a few years. It's of course a no ID, never could find the ID for this one, and I always told you guys that it smells like a clothes softener or something of the sorts. Well, I smelled her this morning as she's just starting to release her fragrance, and I know what it smells like. It smells like freesias. And I know this because I had a lot of freesias uh, this spring, which I did not film. I'm so sorry, you guys. But I had a lot of variety with the freesias, and some of them smelled exactly like this orchid. So, yeah, the red cat Leah smells like a freesia. And I'm sorry that I don't have an ID, but if you ever see her in stores, flower shops, or garden centers, she's a commercial hybrid. Now you know, she is fragrant and she is quite lovely. And the fragrance is absolutely delightful. Alrighty, let's get to the questions. So let's start off with Erika's question on yesterday's video. And she's asking if I drained, oh, sorry, if I drilled the drainage holes in my transparent pots and yeah i think i mentioned it did i forget to mention in the video i'm sorry if i forgot but yeah i do have drainage holes as you can see and two of them will be used by the wick and the other ones are just there to catch whatever water vapor evaporates some of the pots with the catlia ceilings also have some side ventilation holes because I reused them. I had these pots with my, I think, Vanda seedlings. I use the pots as baskets so they do have ventilation holes as well, but it doesn't matter. I'm not keen on making ventilation holes. Um, so yeah, I do put drainage holes at the bottom. It's not like the semi-hydro setup. And to also answer Paul Saunders' question regarding these pots, what is the diameter and height of the pots? What are they called? Where did I get them? Um, again, did I forget to say it in yesterday's video i don't even remember uh, these are store-bought you go to the grocery shop and you find little containers like these which are for microwave reheating only that's what it says on them practically they're food containers this is food safe plastic it's polypropylene and i buy them in bulk one euro thirty four five or six of them something of the sorts i don't know the brand i really don't melo i think this is how it's called hold up let me see if i still have something sealed from them okay so here is the brand i think it's called melo and it's made in greece i think who knows uh but it's a great company i think either Cypriot or Greek. I find them in uh, supermarkets here. I don't remember the size of this guy. This is something else, it's a taller container. So let's guesstimate. I would say it's around 13 centimeters or 12 centimeters uh, diameter. It goes into a little bit of a cone shape and the height maybe seven centimeters or so. So it's pretty similar to a standard Phalaenopsis pot, maybe slightly, slightly narrower, but not as tall. And these pots, I think I have the dimensions of these. These are made in Italy, round lux, 11 centimeter. Oh, okay, so this is 11 centimeters, meaning this one might be 12 because it sits on top. Angela is asking if I think microfiber would wick just as well as synthic. Didn't I mention this? What type of video did I make? I think I mentioned it at some point. Yes, an absolute dupe, if you will, for Synthic, a better one that is, is microfiber. You can absolutely use it. Remember I had my Vandas in microfiber? Yeah, it works great. And it wicks all the time. Even if it gets dry and you wet it, it wicks. It doesn't repel water at all. So absolutely, you can go ahead and shred some microfiber cloths. If you want to make a wick out of them, it works beautifully. Anna is saying that she lives in Germany in a cold climate and she has an orchid room which she heats up and she wants to try Lekka and is wondering if I think Lekka could work in her environment. Well, okay, there are a few things that I would like to address here. Number one, Lekka is clay, therefore it will be slightly cooler. But why is it cooler? We need to know why this happens. It's because of the evaporative cooling. The faster the water evaporates, the cooler the leka will be. If water doesn't evaporate, leka just sits at room temperature. If leka is dry, it will not be cooler than the environment. It needs to be wet and evaporating that water to be cool. So, depending on the degree of evaporation, the leka will stay cooler or not. And I also want to address something that somebody said these days. They were saying they cannot use glazed ceramic pots as masks because their environment is cold and this is out of the question. Well, glazed ceramic pots do not benefit from 
evaporative cooling because they don't let water evaporate. They're glazed, therefore they will always be the temperature of the environment or whatever temperature the environment had at some point. If you're warming up or cooling the environment, they will still have the temperature the environment had previously to you, altering the temperature. So yes, they might seem cool to the touch, but it just has to do with the texture, with the fact that they're very flush, they don't have a porous surface. So you're touching a lot of this material. And yes, it does seem cooler, but it's the very same exact temperature as the environment. There is no evaporative cooling or any other force to induce cooling of this material, therefore there is no cooling involved. Returning to your question, you have to try it out because it depends. If your environment is very, very dry, then the Leica will evaporate more and faster. It might actually stay a little cooler. However, if your environment has such a balance that doesn't favor fast evaporation of water, maybe the Leica will not stay as cool. In the end, you know what you can do if you find a little bag of Leica to experiment with? First of all, do not pot any orchid in it. Just make the setup as it were with an orchid, just don't pot anything and get an aquarium thermometer and simply measure the temperature inside or if you want to just feel it with your hands. If it's very, very cold, you'll feel it and just see how fast it dries, how cold it stays. And if you want to try it out with an orchid but you don't wanna risk any of your orchids, go to the store, find a mini Phalaenopsis or even a normal Phalaenopsis, maybe a discounted one and try it out with that one. Because not only is it cheap, but if stuff goes wrong, a Phalaenopsis can endure and can bounce back faster than any other type of orchid. With Phalaenopsis, you do have time to see that the roots are not in good condition, take it out, save whatever roots she has, and that Phalaenopsis will make a full recovery within the year. With other orchids, you cannot say that. With Cattleyas, no, it's not gonna happen. Oncidiums, again, it's not gonna happen. So that's why we say try it out with a Phalaenopsis. Even if stuff goes bad, you don't have to destroy the Phalaenopsis, but you have time to act and you can actually recover the Phalaenopsis really, really fast if you don't rot the new structures, that is, but we're not talking about that here. So yeah, go ahead and try it out. Phalaenopsis are warmer growers as well, so if stuff are a little bit too cold, the fowl will tell you. And I hope this helps you out. Monemita is asking, how do I keep my Phalaenopsis leaves so shiny and glossy? I don't. It is actually natural. These are summer blooming Phalaenopsis, everything that you see here, and naturally they have very glossy new leaves. This is the Bellina, this is a primary hybrid of a summer blooming orchid, here is the Violacea. Everything is very, very, very glossy. I don't do anything in particular to them. That oil that we put on them with the treatment, it's still there a little bit, but not that much. It's almost completely gone. Um, and as you can see, the gloss kind of remained on the new leaves. This is a trick we like to call selective filming. <laughs> if we only film the Phalaenopsis, then yes, everything looks glossy and showered and, I don't know, treated in a way. But if we film something else, the story kind of changes. Nothing is glossy anymore. Because these orchids naturally are not as glossy as Phalaenopsis orchids. So with the fowls, especially the summer blooming ones, it's just natural. They have natural glossy leaves. In time, this gloss kind of disappears. But even with normal Phalaenopsis, their leaves, let me just show you an example. There you go. Uh, their newest leaves are always glossier than the older ones. Maybe not to such an extent as the summer blooming ones, but still it's uh, pretty glossy. So um, I don't really do anything. I sometimes shower them when they're extremely dusty, but I don't do this very often because I actually risk water getting trapped in the crown and in between the leaves and rotting these structures. So if you will, it's a camera trick. Only Phalaenopsis are these glossy. I don't think I have any other orchid which is as glossy. Valency is asking, how long does it take for the seedlings to mature to blooming size? And if I use any fertilizer, with the cattleyas. About the fertilizer, now I know I talked about fertilizer in yesterday's video, so make sure that you watch the entire video and the question will be answered because I kind of elaborate on the whole fertilizer situation with cattleya seedlings. No point in repeating it now because it's going to take a while, but regarding your first question, it depends. It's tricky. Depends on how big the seedling is and how big it is when it's mature. The seedlings that you saw yesterday are about two, three years away from blooming, 
but again depends how fast they grow. They're the type of seedlings or actually varieties that grow only one suitable per year. That extends a little bit things. You also have to consider the variety. So I have here two what look like immature orchids, believe it or not. So which one do you think will bloom sooner? This one, right? Maybe not. Because you see, this is a Cattleya walkeriana or Valkeriana, depends how you want to pronounce it. Different people around the world pronounce orchid names in many different ways and they're all correct. Don't worry about it. So this is naturally a small type of Cattleya and even if this is a very young plant, I don't need to wait for it to produce a very large pseudobulb in order to be able to bloom. This one can actually bloom by the end of the year. It doesn't have sheets, it doesn't have buds on top of the canes. Well, the Valkeriana produces spikes from a different growth which arises from the base. But because she's a small Cattleya, you can have the surprise to have blooms even next year. This one, on the other hand, looks bigger, but at maturity, this plant is a lot, lot bigger. If the orchid at maturity needs to be around 40, 50 centimeters in height, and you have an orchid looking like this, which produces only one suitable per year, oh, you have around two to three years ahead of you still. The purpurata that I had was actually in this situation because these pseudobulbs need to grow twice as big as they are. And since it only has one pseudobulb growth per year, you know, it can take two to three years. So size can be deceiving at this point. You have to know what variety you have and the growth pattern of that variety. If it ever has been set back and things of the sorts, it's very variable, but usually everything takes around two to three years if they're proper seedlings, but it can take more than that if you stale the orchid. Sophie is asking if I can help the Mastavalia that has a little black spot on the crown and if I know what it is. Well, first of all, um, what is the crown of the Mastavalia? I will guess because Mastavalias actually don't have crowns, they're sympodials. But I will guess it's somewhere on the leaf. If it is, well, maybe it's a sign that you're not watering enough, that's one or that you're over fertilizing. These orchids are sensitive to getting dry. Oh, she's not dry, thank goodness, I need to water it. Whenever I let this orchid go dry in the summertime, she does this for me. So that's a possibility, but also salt buildup is a possibility as well. Try to reduce the fertilizing, if you are fertilizing a little bit too much, if you think you are. Reduce a little bit the fertilizer situation, maybe to half or to a quarter. Also try to use more pure water. If your tap water is pretty high in mineral salts, you might wanna go for distilled water with added fertilizer. These orchids are a little sensitive to just uh, being dry, being too hot, having some salt build up. They're slightly finicky. So do look into these potential factors and try to improve a little bit where you think you could improve. And a last question for today, Alan is asking if I can make a video about my other plants too. Well, uh, many of you might not know I do have a second channel, I just didn't post in a ton of years. It's called Miss Garden Girl and I started off by posting um, stuff that I grew on my terrace. I didn't post in a long time, some stuff happened, but I'm ready to get back to that channel and do things right. This is the third summer that I spent here and the second one where I'm trying to grow other plants outside. Most of them did not make it, I'll just tell you, because the drip watering system is not enough. There are some difficulties because it's a terrace, it's not ground level, and I don't have the freedom to do a lot of stuff. For example, if the pots are overflowing with water or something, it's a problem. Um, so I cannot have pots overflowing with water. So the drip system thing didn't work for this reason. Second of all, I didn't install it properly and the soil was not moist enough. Anyway, I ran into a lot of issues. I didn't have time actually to address them. And when a lot of things go wrong at the same time, you know, you just don't know what to start first. So I took a little bit of a break, uh, regrouped my thoughts and I came up with self-watering pots. You might wonder why I'm going self-watering now. It started a few months ago with the terrace, to be fully honest with you, but more about that on the second channel, which I will start to post hopefully this week or next week. And yes, my other plans will be on that channel. Check the link down below. You will see a few videos, um, but yeah, I didn't post in a long time. So for those of you who keep asking about it, I will restart it. I just needed a break to regroup and to have a little bit more time and to do things properly because uh, the things that I tried to do, the drip watering and everything did not work. This is not a garden, this is a terrace. And if stuff drips or doesn't look good, I can't do them. Um, and I learned.
but I think I found the way to make my terrace beautiful and yeah we'll start next week so already guys this has been it with my uh, Q&A session for today I know there are a lot more questions that I sometimes don't have time to answer in the comments or in the video I'm trying to find ways to I don't know try to answer them in a more efficient way but there are so so many so many comments I'm trying to get through them and select the ones to respond and so on but um, I'm doing a poor job currently, so I will try to find ways to answer them more conveniently But I do hope you've enjoyed today's session and you know the drill if you did give it a thumbs up If you hated it give it a thumbs down subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos Tutorials experiments and everything orchids and if you like YouTube to notify you whenever I upload a video Just turn on notifications for my channel and with that said I'll see you all next time. Bye